The Tory leadership contenders have appeared at yet another hustings, this time in Cheltenham. The energy crisis was a major topic and Liz Truss was asked what she planned to do about bills spiralling out of control. We need to make sure we're using our reserves in the North Sea and incentivising companies to do that. We need to make sure we're fracking in parts of the country where there is local support for that taking place. One thing I absolutely don't support is a windfall tax. I think it's a Labour idea. It's all about bashing business and it sends the wrong message to international investors and to the public. But then what do the public think about energy giants making three billion pounds in profits while, by the way, they're already three billion pounds in debt to them? Well, first of all, I don't think profit is a dirty word. And the fact it's become a dirty word in our society is a massive problem. I mean, profit hasn't really become a dirty word. What people don't like is the fact that you've got these companies making billions and billions of pounds, which they haven't earned. It was luck. You know, there was a war in Ukraine, which for most people is a tragedy. For an oil company is, you know, that's the jackpot. They're making billions while everyone else is, is struggling with higher prices. This isn't, oh, no, we don't value entrepreneurship. We don't value innovation anymore. This is we don't like people who are already incredibly rich getting something for nothing while the rest of us are suffering. Moving on, Truss is ruling out a windfall tax on massive energy profits. And separately, she's also said that she isn't in favour of handouts to those hit hardest by energy price increases. Instead, Truss is proposing tax cuts. She says she'll reverse the 1.25% increase in national insurance that Rishi Sunak brought in in April. But it turns out that despite her protestations to the contrary, this isn't going to be much use for people most struggling with their bills. The Tony Blair Institute has crunched the numbers. They write this. Liz Truss has suggested that further handouts aren't the answer. Instead, she has proposed reversing the national insurance increase designed to fund health and social care to help ease the crisis. That offsets a large chunk of the October price shock for well-off households, but it does very little for those who are most exposed to this price shock. With a national insurance cut, households in the bottom half of incomes will still be on average more than £50 a month worse off. Reversing the rise, therefore, won't do anything to help the people for whom bills at these levels will be well beyond anything they can afford to pay. For the poorest tenth of households, the tax cut would help them by by just 76 pence per month on average, whereas the richest households in the UK will be better off by 93 pounds a month. So what Truss is dressing up as a tax relief for ordinary Britons, in fact, looks like a bung to her wealthy Tory base. Those findings were put to Truss ally Therese Coffey by Nick Ferrari on LBC. Talk about a new prime minister. Perhaps I can share with you research or News put out by former Prime Minister, the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change has said Liz Truss's plans to reverse the increase in national insurance would save households on the lowest income 76 pence a month. The candidate you favour, she doesn't get her sums right, does she? Oh, she absolutely does. And this is, a I think, about an average of £170 for working households is uh, my understanding. Uh, however, the important thing, I think, in the approach that Liz uh, takes in her economic plan, we've heard this morning that the economy has contracted um, and we don't want, understandably, uh, we want it to grow. Uh, sadly, the Bank of England forecast is for a deeper recession than perhaps uh, the government would like. And that's why Liz wants to set out a, more of an approach about how we get that growth and also put more money into the pocket of people straight away by reducing things like the pence. national insurance levy. But, but, uh, and indeed, uh, it's well, it's considerably more than that for the average working household, uh, well, as you will well know, no, here uh, we are. Nick. So the, the better indeed, households will be, off, will be better off, the richer households, I'm sorry, will be better off by some £93 a month. So this is a classic Conservative policy, isn't it? You're looking after those who are well off, £93 a month, down at the bottom end of the scale, 76 pence a month, according to calculations. Far from it, sir, Nick, because we've, from what's Blair also Institute. happened under a Conservative government is that we've increased the national insurance threshold. So there are fewer people paying uh, national insurance than there were before. So, you know, frankly, Tony Blair has got nothing to shout about in helping the poor during the financial crisis that happened under uh, Gordon Brown's watch, uh, not helped by uh, Tony Blair's legacy. Uh, no extra support was given to people um, on very low incomes, far from it. And in fact, this government has stepped up and helped households. Just to pick up on Coffee's point about the Labour government, which we don't always defend, 
Coffey is right that Gordon Brown didn't introduce any new special measures to help the poorest during the 2008 financial crash. But that's in part because it was a very different kind of crisis. The 2008 recession didn't come with a massive inflation shock. Instead, the problem was a hit to growth and then a big uptick in unemployment. And on that front, Brown didn't do too bad a job. He introduced a stimulus budget, which saw the UK economy begin to recover. And between 2009 and 2010, the last year of the Labour government, the economy actually grew by 3.1%. But that good work was undone the following year. When the coalition came in, the growth shrunk or growth shrunk to just 0.3%. It's been anemic ever since. Another reality Coffee ignores is the different states, Labour and Tory governments, left the British economy and before it faced these shocks. On the one hand, the global financial crisis came after 13 years of Labour investment in services and benefits, which meant that when unemployment did increase, its effects were tempered. According to Full Fact and the Institute for Fiscal Studies, in 13 years of Labour government, education spending as a share of GDP increased by 1.6 percentage points from 4.1 to 5.7%. This is an equal record increase along with a 13-year period to 1965, where education spending as a share of GDP also rose by 1.6 percentage points. Health spending as a share of GDP increased by 2.9 percentage points from 4.7 to 7.6%. This was a record increase since the Second World War. Finally, total spending as a share of the economy increased by 9.6 percentage points, also a peacetime record compared to any other 13-year period. Now, why does this matter? It matters because if you have decent free services and a decent welfare system, then economic shocks won't put millions of households at immediate risk of extreme poverty. But the Tories did the opposite. This is what happened from 2010. Welfare spending on families dropped by almost a half in eight years after austerity measures introduced caps on benefits. Education and welfare spending for single people was also cut. And that meant by 2018, 14.5 million people were already living in poverty. And that was before we were hit with COVID and inflation. Now, I think this all really matters, and it matters because it completely puts on its head the classic Tory charge that Labour didn't fix the roof while the sun was shining. The Tory line has been that Labour spent too much on public services and that that meant we weren't in a good position to deal with a crisis. The precise opposite is the truth. Because Labour had invested in public services and benefits, people were better able to handle a recession when it came. And the opposite is the case now, because everything has been cut to the bone over the past decade. But the precise opposite is true. Because Labour had invested in public services and benefits, people were better able to handle a recession when it came. And the opposite is the case now because everything has been cut to the bone over the past decade, when external shocks come along, in this case, COVID and inflation, the whole system collapses. Aaron, I, I want your take on this. And I suppose especially, you know, we heard for such a long time, the whole media accept this line that Labour didn't prepare for a crash because they spent too much money. And it is, I do think the precise opposite is the case. The reason, you know, obviously the financial crisis is bad for many people, but it could have been much worse and it would have been much worse if we went into that, you know, terrible economic moment with public services already on their knees and with people already in dire poverty. But because, you know, there were lots of problems with new labor, Iraq, you know, the most significant of them. But when it came to investing in services and, and uh, benefits, they might not have all, always have done it in the way that we wanted, but they did do it. And that meant that we were, we were much better prepared. They did, in a way, fix the roof when the sun was shining. I mean, wh what do you make of this? I half agree with you. I have to say, Michael, as much as we've disagreed with Blair and Brown, on this show, and I'm particularly talking about Brown here because, of course, he was the Prime Minister in 2008. It's quite funny when Therese Coffey bla blames Blair for the global financial crisis. She was saying, well, that's on Blair's watch, and actually it was on Gordon Brown's watch, and it's just, this woman's an idiot. She should be, she should be nowhere near power. Um, it, it is really important to say that, had this been David Cameron and George Osborne, can you imagine how much worse it would have been? Can you imagine? Like, the level of multilateral coordination between Federal Reserve, the US government, the British government, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, the, Jap you know, the Bank of Japan. Gordon Brown was at the center of that, as was one of his advisors, Baroness Vidira. You know, I, we don't need to go over the top and say Gordon Brown was the mastermind who saved the global economy, but he made a real contribution. Now, can you imagine George Osborne doing that? Or Sajid Javid? Really? Or Rishi Sunak? Of course you can't. And I'm, people watching this know I'm not some sort of fluffer for New Labour. I'm critical of them where they need to be criticized. 
But in 2008, wow, we really were lucky to have that man at the helm. Really. And in terms of the uh, fixing the roof thing, there's two problems here under the Conservatives. The first is that they don't generate growth after 2010. There is, there's, no, there's not the growth for the tax receipts to fund the public services like there is before. As I said, between 1995 and 2007, I think we get something like 64 consecutive quarters of growth. Never happened before. That's why you get that famous line from Gordon Brown. We've ended boom and bust. Obviously, came part in 2007-8 with the global financial crisis. What we've not recovered since then is a growth model. So before that crisis, we do have a growth model. It's not very sustainable, it turns out. Financialization, the city of London, um, obviously rising um, real estate prices. You think house prices are going up right now? I think between 97 and 2007, they were going up by an average of 12% a year, every year. You know, you had an explosion in house prices under Blair Brown. Um, you have obviously uh, PFI. You have cheap consumer durables coming over from China. You still, still have very cheap energy. You know, you're looking at petroleum at like 20, 30, $40 a barrel for most of the late 90s, 2000s, before the global financial crisis. So you have this beautiful Goldilocks era, which creates growth for new labor to then use the dividend of to fund public services. The question is, would new labor have had a growth model after 2010, had, say, Gordon Brown won that general election? I think we probably would have had a better growth model than the Tories because they don't have one whatsoever, but I, I, I don't think they would have been there. So we get this line from Labour, well, if we'd had the trend growth before 2007, since 2010, then we'd be this much richer. Well, that's not happened anywhere on earth. Well, that's not true. Actually, no, it's not happened anywhere on earth. Even in China, there's not been the trend growth since 2010 as there was before the global financial crisis. You know, now China averages 7 or 8% growth a year before it was like 10, 11% growth. Ditto pretty much everywhere else. So it's a stupid thing for Labour to say because that growth model, really the only person who thought about it in British politics was Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell. Of course, nobody's allowed to say that probably in legacy media for the next five years, but that is the facts. Um, secondly, a big part of those tax receipts, as an extension of what I've just said, was coming out, of course, of the City of London financial services industry, this massive thing which was generating big corporate tax receipts to fund all this stuff. Now, of course, financial services has contracted since 2007 to an extraordinary extent at first, but it's never come back. Um, and again, that's another thing which we've not really solved. Okay, well, where are we going to generate tax revenues to pay for this stuff? Clearly, the answer is on the digital giants. Clearly, the answer is on the ultra-rich. Clearly, the answer is on um, capital gains, which are accumulating, whether that's stocks, whether it's house price values. Um, you know, Clearly, that's where we generate those funds. But of course, that's a little bit controversial. You know, So we just pretend that we can, you know, we can generate the kind of taxes we did before uh, with what was the magic money tree of the corporate tax receipts coming out of the City of London. But that's not really, that's not really possible. So I half agree with you, Michael. But I agree with you entirely that we were very lucky to have Gordon Brown at the helm in 2008. Thank God it wasn't Rishi Sunak or George Osborne, both entirely useless. Well, I mean, ideally, it would have been someone who used the moment to actually get corporations in check, right? I mean, instead of temporarily nationalizing the banks, he could have you know, actually properly done it and then made sure that, that the, the speculative economy that he'd allowed to sort of get out of control over the previous 10 years was, you know, put a lid on it. Well, I suppose the point I'm making is, that, you know, they're, they're always saying the reason we weren't prepared for the financial crisis was because we borrowed too much money. It's a precise opposite. I mean, we weren't prepared for the financial crisis in the sense that we hadn't regulated private finance and we had an economy that was too much too based on rising house prices. But the only way in which you can say we had prepared for it is that our public services were in a fairly healthy state and people weren't already living on the breadline. And it's in, in sort of the topsy-turvy through the looking glass world of the British media, the precise opposite suddenly becomes the accepted wisdom, which even Labour are too terrified to, to counter.